Okay. All right. Um, so my name is Oli. Uh, I'm a lecturer in geocomputation at the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis. And I had been working on this tool for a while, which I thought was pretty cool uh, when I discovered it uh when i when i discovered i so i didn't discover the actual um interference pattern or, or the the nature of this interference to begin with basically this israeli geospatial uh, researcher that i follow on twitter in 2018 noticed while working with uh sar imagery in israel that there was a lot of interference and he accidentally you know when you work with sar imagery you try to minimize interference and you do so by usually if you're aggregating temporally uh selecting the minimum value in the in the returns for a given time period and he was doing some geoprocessing and accidentally selected the maximum value instead of the minimum value over a time period and he noticed not only a large amount of interference but interference that made a very distinctive pattern and when he sort of interrogated the nature of that interference and when he zoomed into the areas over which that interference was happening he quickly discovered that uh they were mostly centered around military bases and then he did a bit more research and found that several of these were missile defense systems in particular the uh, mim 104 patriot missile system which is an american anti-missile uh system that functions conceptually in a very similar way to Israel's Iron Dome. So it has an active radar that is scanning for projectiles coming at it in a very fast way. And if it identifies something coming towards it, it will automatically trigger a missile that will fly at the incoming projectile and attempt to destroy it. But in order to do that, obviously, it needs to be uh, listening for incoming projectiles. And um, this random geospatial researcher that I follow on Twitter kind of discovered this and, and, and made a post about it and was like, huh, this is, this is interesting. Um, but I, I was very sorry, taken, taken by this finding. And it, the, the issue was that it wasn't something that really anyone could do if they were so inclined to, uh, it involved, you know, you, you have to work you have to do some coding and you have to work with, um, you have to import the synthetic aperture radar imagery and you have to aggregate it over a certain time period and you have to disaggregate it based on orbital paths and you have to you know, select a maximum value. So this isn't something that anyone um, could necessarily just do very quickly. So my modest contribution to this, I did not discover the fact that these radars, these missile defense radars interfere with Sentinel-1 imagery. Um, Basically, all I did was build a user interface around this that does the, the, the pre-processing for you um, that allows you to, that allows anyone basically to click and drag and identify military radars in this way. And this is something that became uh, strangely relevant in the weeks after that article uh, with Bellingcat and the tool were published. So let's let's get into what this is and, and how it works. So there are two main types of satellite. Uh, there are optical satellites, which basically have sunlight reflected by the earth, uh, and they capture those wavelengths, mostly in the sort of visible spectrum, but then the visible part of the spectrum, but then also sometimes they extend slightly beyond. You get some optical sensors that get infrared uh, and shortwave infrared, uh, but you know, most most of the satellites, Earth, observ Earth observing satellites that are out there use optical imagery. Um, and yeah, they function obviously in, in, in very similar way to the way that our eyes see the world and the ways that cameras take pictures. The second class of sensors are uh, active sensors. And, and the main one in this category are synthetic aperture radar satellites, which send out pulses of radio waves and measure the backscatter you lose some useful optical artifacts like colors and um, shadows and, and stuff like that. But you are able to do a bunch of other cool things like see through clouds um, and, and image at night uh, in situations where you know, sunlight isn't available to you. Now, the European Space Agency's Sentinel-1 satellite sends out pulses of radio waves 
in the civilian C band. So between like 4,000 and 8,000 gigahertz. And the, yeah, this is the, the wavelength of the radio waves that are being sent out by the uh, ESA's Sentinel-1 satellite. By sheer coincidence, the radar set on a Patriot missile sends out pulses of, of radio waves as well. And it sends these out using the NATO G band, which is also 4,000 to 6,000 gigahertz, which is within the same range uh, as, as the Sentinel-1 satellite. So what happens when this occurs? So, so the way that Sentinel-1 uh, Sentinel images in, well, one of the modes in which Sentinel-1 images, the uh, uh, IW mode is for, as the, as the satellite passes, it sends out a pulse of radio waves and it measures the backscatter. And that, that pulse will have the, the swath that it illuminates in any given, uh, uh, as it's passing, is about five kilometers wide uh, and 250 kilometers long. And it, it images as it goes in, in these sort of swaths. Um, now, in normal, imaging, it simply records the backscatter that is that, that returns to the satellite after it sends out uh, the pulse of radio waves. But if there is a potent source of C-band radio waves present on the ground, then it will affect the entire swath that the system is located in. So it'll create this sort of stripe across the image collection. Um, and you can usually get rid of these by if you've aggregate if you have multiple passes over the same location. Chances are this radar isn't on all the time. Um, you can minimize. You can just select the minimum pixel value if you've got multiple collections of this location, and it'll get rid of this this big stripe because obviously the return signal is much higher here because it's not only measuring the backscatter but then also a direct blast of C-band waves from some ground-based source. Um, so this value will be quite high. Uh, usually you would filter these out by minimizing um, over a, a time period uh, the, the pixel value. But if you maximize, then if a radar was turned on at any point over the time period in which you're aggregating, it will identify it. So if you have like, oh, if you aggregate over the course of a year and the radar was only turned on for one day when Sentinel-1 was overhead, you can see that radar because this will in all likelihood be the maximum value for this area in a given year because it's quite hard to to achieve um uh, yeah for, for the return signal to be as strong as uh not only the return signal itself but the blast from the ground-based system so you can bring out this type of interference simply by maximizing um the pixel values of an image collection over a given time period. But so this is already pretty interesting because it allows us to narrow down the location of a ground-based radar to a five kilometer by 250 kilometer area. Uh, but we can further narrow things down by exploiting the fact that the Sentinel-1 constellation uh, will image both in an ascending and descending orbital path. So if you think of the way the satellite orbits the Earth, it's going around uh, the Earth in this way, but it's, it's rotating on, on sort of two axes, and it will eventually image the same point on Earth going in an ascending orbital path, but then eventually it will also image that part of the Earth in a descending orbital path, and it will, it will basically make those image collections at a slightly different angle, it will pass at a, at a slightly different angle, um, which means that, you know, because it creates a stripe and the radar system is located within that stripe, if we get another collection at a different angle, and we can, we can color these differently um, as well to, to sort of distinguish between the ascending and descending um, orbital passes, then we can narrow down the location of the ground-based radar system to the area of the two sort of interference stripes, the RFI stripes that are generated, where they overlap. And this considerably narrows down the, the search area for, for one of these systems. Now, there are obviously military radars are not the only source of C-band radio waves 
uh, that that exist on planet Earth. There are plenty of C-band weather radars. There are a lot of telecom infrastructure. Five five G, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is C-band, right? Five gigahertz would fall within that uh, four thousand to to eight thousand range. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of stuff that generates C-band radio waves. How can we be sure that what's causing this type of interference isn't just a weather radar or um, you know, a cell tower or something. It seems to be, and I haven't verified this, and there's, there's um, as far as I know, no, no literature on this, really. It seems to be that the only radars that are powerful enough and sort of angled in the correct way to cause this type of interference are missile defense radars, which are overwhelmingly sort of scanning the sky uh, for incoming projectiles and quite powerful. Uh, but this, again, is where my expertise ends and, and, and yours begins. So one thing to table perhaps for the Q&A would be uh, why specifically military radars cause this type of interference and not other types of, of uh, C-band radars that exist. So that is a, a brief overview of the methodology. And then really quickly, um, the... so the ground-based system will create a stripe of interference roughly five kilometers by 250 kilometers wide to create a false color image using these uh, to create a false color image that that most strongly brings out this type of interference um i've colored the ascending orbital pass red so you know when you create a false color image you have to specify which values so so like which um bands or which um values from your image collection are assigned to which color channel. So the values in the ascending orbital pass are assigned to the red channel, and the values in the descending orbital pass are assigned to the blue channel, and the green channel is uh, assigned to a composite of the uh, VV polarization, so the vertical-vertical polarization. The red and blue channels um, visualize the vertical horizontal polarization uh, and for whatever reason again this is this is a question for you um, these military radars primarily seem to cause interference almost exclusively in the vh polarization so there are instances in which you can pick up interference in the in the vv polarization but they're very rare i have a couple examples for you coming up but overwhelmingly, um, it's the VH polarization that this interference is visible in. So that's that's a just a quick side note. Ascending VH is red, descending VH is blue, and green is a composite of the VV um, from from both ascending and descending orbital passes. Um, so that's how we generate this sort of X that. Um, that identifies the locations of these active ground-based radar systems. So what does this look like? Um, here's an example from the Polish border with Ukraine three days ago. Um, this, you can see the border here. This is Ukraine, this is, whoop, this is Poland. And yeah, this was taken on March 15th, uh, 2022. And this is what the interference looks like. And I have zoomed into one um, portion of it so that you can sort of see the exact nature of, of the interference um, in this instance. Now, Poland, quite a close ally of the United States, has received many uh, Patriot missile systems through foreign military sales by uh, the United States, uh, particularly under the Obama administration. And it's very possible that this type of interference was caused by a Patriot missile. And it does look like the interference caused by Patriot missiles in locations that we know um, Patriot missiles are active. But there are many different types of interference and, and they don't always look exactly like this. Here's another example from Russian occupied Crimea that was taken on uh, the third, uh, sorry, on the 10th of um, March, so last week. And I had actually never seen interference that looked like this. 
it's this sort of narrow stripe or these two narrow stripes in part of the collection. And then this one narrow stripe with sort of fainter bits over here. And you can see that's quite different to, to the signature from this other, uh, th this radar on the Polish border. Now, this is, yeah, in, in Northern Ukraine, uh, sorry, in, in Northern Crimea. And it was taken when the fighting between the Russian forces and the Ukrainian forces in a lot of the Southern cities like Mariupol um, and uh, not Kharkiv, the other one in the South, uh, basically when Russia was making a push towards these two major cities in the South of Ukraine, this radar uh, popped up at the same time. And it, it has quite a different signature from the, the what, what may well be a Patriot missile that we saw in, in Poland. So there are a number of Russian missile defense systems that we know use uh, the C-band for their radars, like the S-400, which is meant to shoot down enemy aircraft and missiles. But there are also some offensive military radars that are used to detect enemy artillery and focus uh, your artillery's fire towards those, um, yeah, the radars that are used to focus uh, artillery, also some of them uh, in the Russian arsenal use C-band. So it could be from either of those, or it could be something else. Again, I've never seen interference that looks like this. Often, um, it, it almost all of the interference that you'll find looks something like this, these little um, disconnected bars that usually have some warbly pattern in the middle. I, I don't know if there's technical language to describe the bars and the warbles, but again, we can get into that in the reverse Q&A. Um, here's another radar. I'm focusing on Ukraine, obviously, because um, I think that's where everyone's mind goes when there's an active war and you figure out how to spot military radars using open source imagery. Uh, this is near Kharkiv in Ukraine. It was taken four days ago. And because it's green, that means that this interference is actually in the VV polarization, which is quite rare. And again, I don't know why that would be. Um, so this is a uh, ascending, this is interference in the ascending orbital pass in the VH polarization. This is interference in the descending orbital pass in the VH polarization as well. And this is interference in the VV polarization. Um, and the, the green channel is a composite of both ascending and, and descending um, passes. And then another weird looking uh, radar, possibly multiple radars present um, and, and the, the RFI is like superimposed, uh, visible near Daimona in Israel, which is where they have their the Negev Nuclear Research Center, which is widely believed to be the location at which Israel uh, develop nuclear weapons, probably a good place to um, protect with a missile defense system, given the neighborhood. Um, but we can see that there are different sort of the, the RFI signatures is quite different. in uh, even in this one collection, we have these long, thin bars, we have these slightly wider bars that some, you know, some of them have almost like a barbershop pole pattern. Um, like this one and this one, these slightly wider bars, and then these long solid stripes as well. So this could be several radars that are superimposed. This could be um, one radar operating in different ways. But in any case, this is an example of a collection in which we have both an ascending and descending. Um, we've detected RFI both in the ascending and descending orbital pass. And we can see that they cross over directly on the Negev Nuclear Research Center. Uh, so we can be fairly confident that this is the, the location. And you know, it also kind of makes intuitive sense uh, that, that somewhere in here is where the radar is located. Uh, and, and this is another weird one that was spotted in the Persian Gulf a couple of days ago. It's, this is quite zoomed in. So it's probably about 500 meters in, in diameter. Uh, but it's just this isolated crosswise uh, stripe. Now, that was just to give you guys a flavor of the different types of interference that this, this picks up. But um, yeah, they're always 
either present in places that you would expect uh, military radars like over Ukraine and then and, and, you know, Israeli nuclear research facilities and, and stuff like that, um, and, and in the Persian Gulf. Now, here's another view of how the interference looks. Uh, this is a graph of the return signal for the VH polarization at the location of a Patriot missile system in Dammam, Saudi Arabia. If you load the radar interference tracker tool, this is uh, the, the default view because it's such a clear example of it. And we can see there's some variation in the return signal uh, over time, but then we can see that at some point in mid 2021, we get massive spikes in the return signal that uh, that persists for quite some time. We can actually see it's, it seems to be turned off for a little period here, but then it gets turned back on. Um, so okay, so that's that's a bit on how the how the tool works. So what the nature of the interference is, what different interference patterns look like, and how we're able to not only identify this interference, but do some image processing that allows us to narrow down the search area um, by creating a false color image and disaggregating the imagery based on the orbital pass of the, of the satellite. So with that in mind, we can get into a case study of how this type of interference can be used to amend or complement our understanding of historical events. Uh, one such historical event was the 2019 attack on the uh, Abqaiq and Quraysh Aramco facility. So Saudi Arabia uh, suffered a devastating attack on its oil infrastructure. Basically, well, there's a video here, which um, I don't know if there's sound, but in any case, I will just play the video. Oh, one second. Is that, is that playing now? No. Hmm. Okay. Um, anything. Oh. It's, it's not playing. Uh, <laughs> I have to, sorry, I have to enable, enable content. Uh, one second. Okay, I think if I press it now, it should play. Oh, come on. Can I not play the video? Hmm. That is, wait. Technical difficulties. Why does this never? One sec. Um, well, even the cover photo is is uh, fairly striking of this um, attack. But right, hold on. Oh, there we go. So. You may not be able to hear what's going on, um, but, but the visuals are what's important here, which is you can see an oil refinery being hit with cruise missiles and uh, drones. So uh, and, and that attack causing quite a lot of, uh, of damage to the facility. So in the rest of this, and again, you, you probably can't hear this because uh, I still haven't figured out how to use PowerPoint after all these years, but the interviewer is asking him why this was able to happen uh, and, and how Saudi Arabia, which has spent billions of dollars, billions of a B, on specifically Patriot missile systems that are meant to guard against exactly this type of attack. Um, and she asks him at one point whether or not he was, whether or not the kingdom was taken by surprise by this attack. Um, and he sort of dodges the question. Now, some more background to this episode. On September 14th, 2019, a combination of drone and missile attacks targeted Saudi Arabia's oil infrastructure at the Abqaiq and Parais uh, Aramco facilities, cutting the country's oil production by over 50% and leading to the largest spike in the price of oil ever reported. So this, by many metrics, um, was the most significant attack on uh, oil infrastructure or perhaps energy infrastructure in history, uh, led to the largest spike in the price of oil ever reported. That's including um, the, the uh, oh, what was it? The OPEC 
crisis. Uh, so, I mean, it was an extremely significant event in terms of its effect on Saudi Arabia's oil output. Uh, the attack was particularly embarrassing for Riyadh because they spent billions of dollars on air defense systems that were thwarted by drones that may have cost as little as 15%. But here's the important part. The expert consensus is that this attack was successful due to a failure of intelligence. So the Saudis were caught off guard and the element of surprise gave Iran a decisive edge. Uh, and we can see that reflected in uh, basically reports that came out following the attack. So here we have the BBC saying it took the Saudis and their US allies completely by surprise, penetrating the security cordon and temporarily knocking out roughly half of Saudi Arabia's processing capability, sending global oil markets reeling. Uh, Dr. Uzi Rubin, who is an expert on missile defense and was the founder and first director of the Israel Missile Defense Organization in the Israeli Ministry of Defense, uh, who himself produced and, or, or not, not he himself, but he oversaw the development, production, and deployment of the country's first missile defense shield, the Aero missile, which was sort of the precursor to Iron Dome. So basically the grandfather of Iron Dome, probably someone who knows a thing or two about defending against missile strikes, um, says the key to avoiding a Saudi-style debacle in Israel is prior intelligence and seamless early warning systems. So squarely placing the blame for this devastating attack on Saudi's oil infrastructure on the fact that they simply didn't know that an attack was coming and this was a failure of intelligence and that this would have been solved with early warning systems. You know, perhaps systems such as radars that are meant to detect <laughs> incoming missiles. And, and respond to them, early warning systems, right? Um, all of this, so he describes the attack and then says that all of this occurred with utter surprise, with no intelligence leaks, and without being detected either upon launch or on the way to the targets. So he again chalks this up to the fact that Saudi Arabia was caught completely by surprise. Um, and then finally, this is the last one I promise, but there, there are many other examples if you Google the 2019 um, Aramco attacks. The Guardian, they, they did a, a piece on how this attack was able to succeed despite um, Saudi Arabia's ample spending on uh, missile defense. They say this attack was something new. It was not something the Saudis were expecting to happen. Um, the US, intelligence, US shares intelligence with Saudi Arabia, but it also has its own limitations. According to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joseph Dunford, we do not have an unblinking eye over the entire Middle East at all times. So even U.S. General Staff, say, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, saying this was a failure of intelligence. But was this actually a surprise? Well, we can check <laughs> because when someone turns on a missile defense radar, particularly a Patriot missile, we can see if it was turned on at a certain time um, and Sentinel-1 was overhead. So what I've done is basically load the tool. This is what it looks like. Um, you can share uh, attacks or you can share its scenes at a particular location, latitude, longitude, and zoom level and date using, it has a sort of like a little API on the end here. Um, but if you get rid of that, it'll just take you by default to uh, a different part of Saudi Arabia. And what we can see here is imagery being loaded in August of 2019. Remember the attack was basically a month after this. We don't see any RFI over, um, so this is the Abqai processing facility, I should say. This is, the, you remember in that video uh, when we saw oil tanks getting hit by cruise missiles, these are the tanks that were getting hit. So this is the facility that was hit by, by the cruise missiles. Um, and we can see that in 2019, including September 2019, which is when the attack occurred, there's no RFI. But then after the attacks, right after 2019, we see a bunch of spikes up here. Uh, and if we load imagery, and you can load imagery from a given time by clicking on it, um, this is a kike, we can suddenly see very strong RFI over the Abkaik processing facility in the immediate aftermath of the attack. So what does this tell us? Okay, maybe they were caught off guard here because there was no missile defense radar turned on. And actually we can see they had turned it on in the past uh, a couple of times, but then hadn't been running it for a long time. Um, and we can see that they're, basically the attacks motivated them to actually 
turn on these missile defense radars in in late 2019 or early 2021, uh, early 2020 rather. And we can see strong RFI over this processing facility in the aftermath of the attacks. But if we again load imagery from uh, just before the attack, so like July 2019, um, again, no RFI over this processing facility probably means that there's no there was no advanced warning of, of the attack. Um, and that gels with the general consensus that they were caught off guard. And if we zoom out here, we can get a picture of what this RFI looks like over the entire, uh, over the entire area. And we can see there's some radars in Bahrain and Qatar and some even off the coast. But if we get to, um, where are we? And we can actually zoom into this graph as well uh, by scrolling. You can zoom in on the graph. Um, in so the attack, remember, was in September 2019. So if I click on September 4th, 2019, for example, right before the attack, or even September September 16th would have been after. So let's go September 4th, right before. Um, we can see there, there is a bit of RFI near Abqaiq, but we can see it's actually originating from Bahrain, right? Because there's uh, the interference lines cross quite neatly over the coast of Bahrain, and this is simply in range. If we look in July 2019, there's nothing up here. But if we look in August, the month before, We also see nothing up here, but we saw a radar up there just a second ago. What happens when we go to September, the month of the attack? Suddenly, a radar appears in this part of Saudi Arabia where, where it hadn't before. Let's, let's have a look at what's going on with this radar. Um, we can query RFI at a given location simply by clicking on the map. So I've clicked on, on this RFI. Um, a tip if you're using the tool is if there is water anywhere, um, if, you're, if the RFI passes over water anywhere, it's, it's very good to measure it over water because there's less background noise and you get a cleaner um, signal for when the, the uh, interference started. And the entire Sentinel-1 co collection is uh, about seven petabytes. So this thing is really crunching, uh, but here we can see Nothing, nothing, nothing until September 9th. We can zoom in and look at this in greater detail. You can see on August 31st, no sign of a radar. Uh, and we can load daily imagery as well, which, which you know, that was a composite. Um, but if I load imagery from like August, for example, August 24th, all quiet, nothing going on here. We can even see some ships off the coast, but then suddenly, on September 9th, if I click here, suddenly something is turned on. Um, and if I zoom in to the area that it's turned on in, I see a configuration of, of three trucks plus a bunch of launchers, which is very characteristic of a Patriot missile defense system. Um, okay, so that's kind of weird. Five days before the largest attack on Saudi Arabia's oil infrastructure, and indeed probably the most significant attack on oil infrastructure in, in history, a missile defense system is turned on for the first time in about five years. And what is a couple hundred meters to the north, but another oil refinery. And this isn't just any oil refinery, this is the Safaniya plant. Um, and if we go back to the presentation, and if we do any background research on the Safania plant, we will find that the Safania oil field, so located just off the coast there that we were looking at, is the largest offshore oil field in the world. It produces 1.3 million barrels of oil per day, and it contains an estimated 34 billion barrels of oil and over 5 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Most of the oil from the field is processed at the Safania processing center, which is what we just looked at located in the country's northeast. I should say much closer to Iran 
then either the um, the Abkaigo Kurais uh, processing facilities. So Safania is here, right? If I if I click there, that's this is where Safania is. Okay, that's it. Um, this is Saudi Arabia. This is Iran, and uh, the attack is uh, believed to have originated at the Omidia Air Base, which is over here. Safania is here. This is the world's largest oil field and the processing center that processes the oil from it. But the attacks actually hit down here, uh, which means that the missiles probably went around and hit. Uh, and we can tell this based on the trajectory of the attack that the missiles hit over here. Um, they, they actually came from the west, uh, despite having been launched from Iran, which means they probably did a, a curve of some kind. But in any case, what this tells us is that maybe the Saudis were caught off guard at the Price and Abqaiq processing facility. So here and here is where they were attacked. Maybe they were caught off guard, and the expert consensus is correct that they were caught off guard at these two facilities. But using open source radar interference, we can tell that a missile defense system was turned on for the first time in five years, five days before this attack at the country's largest oil refinery, which also happens to be located quite a lot closer to Iran than these other two areas. So this now we enter the realm of tinfoil hats, but that's either a hell of a coincidence or this RFI pattern may suggest that the Saudis actually did have advanced warning of this attack and this was not an intelligence failure. Uh, they simply knew the attack was coming and somehow still were not able to defend themselves, which is obviously something that is, in my opinion, far more embarrassing for Saudi Arabia. Um, so yeah, just to recap, and we can tell uh, both the Abqaiq processing center and the Safaniya processing center. So this place was the place that was hit by the attacks. And this is the place where Saudi Arabia probably expected the attacks. These are both locations that are on the CIA's list of critical foreign dependencies. So the CIA maintains a list of locations that are vital to US national interest um, and worthy of direct US protection if the host country is not able to protect it. This is a secret cable that was published uh, happily on, on WikiLeaks for us to all read. But we can tell that both of these locations are critical foreign dependencies for the United States, which again, this is total conjecture, but um, if these are areas that the US has a vested interest in protecting as well, then perhaps uh, you know, there's also a scenario in which maybe US intelligence pulled Saudi Arabia, hey, um, it seems like Iran may be planning an attack on your, on your oil infrastructure, uh, you better defend it because we also really need you to defend these, these processing centers. They're critical foreign dependencies for us. Uh, maybe you should keep an eye out. We've, we've given you the weapons to defend yourselves, these Patriot missiles. Um, maybe you should turn them on. Uh, and, and maybe dutifully, Saudi Arabia turns on their missile defense systems at the location they think most likely uh, for uh, an Iranian attack. Um, and it seems like maybe they then actually miscalculated. Um, so yeah, the, the final recap. In 2019, Iran successfully carried out the largest attack on oil infrastructure in history by hitting Aramco facilities in Abqaiq and Faraiz. The expert consensus was that the attack was successful due to an intelligence failure and that the Saudis were caught completely off guard. But radar interference suggests that Saudi Arabia was expecting the attack or there was a massive coincidence. For the first time in four years, Saudi Arabia switched on a Patriot battery facing Iran to guard its largest offshore oil field five days before the attack on Abqaiq. Um, so this is how open source RFI brought out by this tool can be used to perhaps like gain a new angle on a historical event that there was a strong consensus uh, on. But that about does it for the introduction of how this tool works and how RFI um, is, how, how to bring out this uh, missile defense based RFI in open source synthetic aperture radar imagery and a case study of how it can be applied to analyze uh, conflicts and then perhaps draw new conclusions. And then also a, a tour of a couple radars in 
uh, Ukraine in the past week. Um, that, that does it for what I've got prepared. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on why, the, why these different patterns um, emerge and why some affect the VV polarization and some affect the VH polarization and why some have these specs and, and, and bars and some have these solid lines. Um, so we can do some, some blended Q and A here, but if you have any questions about what I've presented so far, I'd be happy to answer them. And if you have any thoughts about uh, what's going on here, I'd love to hear them, but thank you for listening.